go back to Jeff now. Mount Hope. Jeff, good morning. Hey, Jeff. Hey, good, good morning, Bev. Good morning, Mars. Uh, yes, we're at the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Mount Hope. It's just uh, about a little 15 minutes outside of the downtown Hamilton and about 30 minutes from Brantford, Ontario. Big air show here this weekend, but this is a very, very special place. Dave Rohr is the CEO of this place. So tell me a little bit about this place that you've got. I mean, I'm looking, we'll show people, but I'm just looking at plane after plane. Tell me about this museum. Well, this museum started in 1972, Jeff, and uh, we have about 46 airplanes. Uh, 23 of them fly. We're the largest flying museum in Canada and normally uh, they're all World War II vintage type aircraft which uh, display the history our flying history we make it come alive as we like to say here and we have the one of two Lancasters in the world we have the only flying right. B-25 we have a Firefly which was the Royal Canadian Navy airplane which you'll see later today I yep. think yep. and we have uh, all the trainers that were part of the British Commonwealth training program so we're really a flying salute to our history and one of the things about the air show this weekend here, which is now one of the largest really in Canada, because since 9-11 it's been tough to do air shows, yes. but you have 30 static planes and 30 flying planes. That's correct. This will likely be the largest air show in Canada this year. We started again three years ago to bring the air show back to Hamilton. The museum started the air show in 1975 in Hamilton, and then through a series of events right. it, uh, it petered out after 2001. Yeah. But we brought it back three years ago. Uh, last year was our 40th anniversary, and we wanted to have a big air show to celebrate our 40th anniversary. So we've continued the tradition. Just do it. Yeah. Well, we're going to bring people parts of the museum throughout the morning. Thanks, Dave. Nice Thank to see you. you. I haven't seen him this excited in a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hey, you know what, guys? And I'll tell you one of the things here. Uh, and of course, there's all these vintage warplanes at the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Mount Hope. But I want to show you uh, part of some of the most controversial, if not the most controversial part of avi aviation history in this country. Now, up here, this is a model of the Avro Arrow. And uh, if you know your history on this, Back in the 1950s, this was developed as an interceptor. It, at the time, was likely going to be the best jet in the world. It could reach unbelievable heights. Now, the government of the day decided, and this is very simplistic, that instead of the Avro Arrow, the Diefenbaker government decided that they would join in with the United States and take their ballistic missiles to protect the threat from the north. And what the government did, and have a look at this picture, this is a very famous picture, is they went into the Avro Aero Company and ordered all of these Avro Arrows destroyed. There were only six or seven of them, all destroyed and cut to pieces. And here at the museum, this is the actual front of the cockpit of an Avro Aero. It's one of only a few pieces that were ever saved from this project. So that's the bulletproof glass. But this is the Iroquois engine. This engine was one of the most advanced jet engines in the world. And look what they did. The government came in and they cut a hole. This is an actual hole. 59. This is the compressor, the compressor. And then back here, this is the hole that was cut in the turbines. So these made these uh, engines, the damage was irreparable. They could never be used. So what a great part of uh, Canadian aviation history. By the way, a lot of the engineers from Avro went on to NASA and helped put a guy on the moon. Interesting stuff here, guys. Yeah. All right, thank you, Bad Mars. Good morning. Dave Rohr is back with us, the CEO of the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum. This is a firefly behind me. Uh, this is the only one in the world currently flying. Dave, tell me about this aircraft. Well, this air, uh, aircraft was in service with the Royal Canadian Navy, flew off the Bonaventure and the Magnificent, was a fighter reconnaissance and, aircraft. With, and those were two of our aircraft carriers. They, they yep. were. They, yep. they, they were. It's the only one in the world flying, and uh, we fly it in salute to all those that flew in the Royal Canadian Navy. And this also has the wings that go up and down, correct? That's correct. For storage on the ship. Yeah, because that's where they did it. They, they needed the space on the ship and away they would go. Absolutely. So, and this one is still flying. Yes, sir. And uh, so, a, a plane, what, do, where did you acquire this one? Well, this one came out of uh, the West Coast and uh, it came out of Victoria, was restored in Victoria and then came, we had two, we lost our first one and mm -hmm. we replaced it with this, with this one. one. All right, so I'll tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to do the weather and then at the end of the weather, I'm going to have them fire up the firefly here so you can hear how loud it is and uh, you'll have to take it from there. But anyway, weather looks like this. Look at this radar shot of that storm system in the United States. But really now moving into southern Ontario, we do have rain in Hamilton, Ontario. As you can see, Windsor in through Kitchener, London, and the potential is there for it to get into Toronto and potential thunderstorms south of the border with tornadoes as well as it moves across the U.S. Midwest to the mid-Atlantic states. In the Mar
Our times, we're also looking at some rain today in Halifax, Charlottetown, Sydney, five millimeters of rain for St. John's as well. Just the way that system is arcing, uh, some areas will get rain, some won't. Temperatures, we're looking at a sun cloud mix in Victoria and Vancouver, and we have uh, temperatures there of 19 and 20, 30 percent chance of showers. Fort McMurray, potentially more rain today. Increasing cloud in Edmonton after that day yesterday, between four and six yesterday afternoon in Edmonton, tornado watches and warnings. Everything worked out okay. Calgary, though, some thunderstorms this afternoon. Rain in Saskatoon, Regina, and then uh, Manitoba as well. Pretty nice sunny conditions, and that's the same in the northwestern Ontario. Uh, we do have the risk of thunderstorms through the Nicobelt region. And again, you'll see clearing in Windsor and eventually in the Hamilton, Toronto region. 60% chance of showers in Toronto. Mainly cloudy in Ottawa, increasing cloud in Montreal. Quebec City, pretty nice day. So clearing in Fredericton, but again, there's your rain in Halifax, Charlottetown, and in through St. John's as well. But a very nice day in Cornerbrook. All right, we're going to give the signal to start the Firefly. And a note to our crew, I won't be able to talk once this starts, so take it away at time. But here we go. Listen to how loud this thing gets. We're into this is the firefly in the starting phase. Ontario, where they have a, a huge weekend. It's the uh, Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum. I'm standing in front of one of only two Lancasters, the workhorse bombers from World War II. One of only two in the world that fly, and it is owned by the museum. The other one is owned by the RAF, which no one can fly. So, I was able to take a flight in this yesterday. And just before we show you that video, I want to show you this. And you can perhaps think about what exactly this is. And uh, we'll show you my flight yesterday, and we'll come back and tell you what this is. The pride and joy of the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Hamilton is this guy right here, the legendary Lancaster bomber. This plane was the workhorse of World War II for the RAF and the RCAF. This one made at the end of the war in 1945 in Malton, Ontario. It's one of two remaining Lancaster bombers in the world, and it's the only one that has flights available to the public, and we're going to go right now. Back door entrance, and away we go. Well, you really got an appreciation for what these World War II airmen went through. Up here to do a job, and it is loud. I mean, incredibly loud. Well, you know, I can tell you, it was truly a privilege to fly in this Lancaster. Like I said before, only one of two in the world that fly, and this is the only one the public can. And I think you come out of there with an appreciation of how these kids, really, in World War II, 19, 20, 21-year-olds, would spend eight hours, nine, ten hours, flying these things to accomplish their mission. And being able to fly in that really gives you a good sense of what they went through, even though I was only up there for a little more than an hour. All right, there we go. And, and it was really something. I mean, the, it's, it's a very heavy plane, and you really have to stand in those tours to see out. The windows on the uh, Lancaster are very, very narrow. You can look out them, but once you get in the turrets and look out, some of the pictures are unbelievable. And I tweeted uh, some of the pictures I took from this plane in flight yesterday, if you want to check those out. Now, before we saw that particular piece of video, I asked you uh, what this was. And what this is, it's known as a cookie. This is a four thousand pound bomb you know a lot of us in our heads have the shape of well this doesn't look like a bomb but believe me it is and it would be mounted uh, up underneath the uh, bomb bay here this is 10 meters long and with 
this particular bomb, and that's why this plane was so great, is because it was one of the few planes that could, if not the only plane, that could carry a bomb this heavy. So with this bomb, it could also carry 12 other smaller bombs, and uh, as their ordinance, and like we said, they'd be flying 8, 10 hours in, in these particular Lancasters. So quite a thrill yesterday to actually get up in this, the only one in the world that the public can fly in. All right, don't forget the air show here in Hamilton uh, this weekend, and we'll be back with more in Canada. Stay with us. Now is also looking great and happy this morning. All right. Thank you, guys. We're in Mount Hope, Ontario. That's near Hamilton at the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum. You know, and I've been impressed by the Lancaster, which is 63,000 pounds empty. And I've also been very impressed by this plane, which is 12,000 pounds. Meet Super Dave, Dave Matheson. How are you doing? Good, you? An aerobatic pilot who flies this plane. Tell me about this plane. Uh, it's the only one of its kind in Canada. It's the, the world's most advanced aerobatic aircraft. And it's uh, made of completely carbon fiber. So it's extremely strong. It'll actually roll at 500 degrees per second and capable of pulling uh, plus or minus 16 Gs, which will which really hurt you. Okay, and what's the horsepower then of this plane? Uh, 385 horse. 385 horsepower. So when you fly, I mean, you've got a cockpit here. Are there, is this for, is this a one-seater or a two-seater? It's a two-seat. Two-seater. And do you fly solo by yourself? Uh, during air shows, always, you fly in the back, and I can't find anyone to go with me. <laughs> you can't find anybody to go with you, and I tell you, I'm not volunteering. So this is made, what's the actual plane made out of? Carbon fiber. Carbon fiber. So, and a plane like this then, um, when you have a plane that's this light, what are some of the challenges in handling it? I mean, just because... It's so light. Well, it's just it's so agile. Like if I, if I move the stick even about an inch, it'll do a roll, and it, it, it's lightning fast. And how long does it take to learn to fly one of these things? All my life. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm still learning. No kidding, eh? And why is this type of plane so rare? Like, why are there only three in North America? Uh, well, there's only 11 built in the world, and so they're sort of scattered all over the world now, and they don't make them anymore. Uh, wow. They stopped making them about two years ago. Okay, and I just wanted to point this out. I thought, oh my gosh, Super Dave's got an errant piece of lint on the end of your wing. But this actually, on the end of this wing, is exceptionally important. What is yeah. that? That's, uh, that tells me when I'm flying backwards. So when I bring the aircraft up and hover it like a helicopter, right. there's airspeed indicators aren't built in reverse. So when that string flips the other way, I know I'm going backwards. So you're looking at the cockpit. You see this, which then would be up like this. Is that right? It'll go right forward. Right forward. And that's the way you tell you're flying backwards. Yeah, and I try to go backwards uh, to about 80 miles an hour. And he makes it sound like, yep, that's what I do. I just look out there. Yep, I'm flying backwards. This is a Mosquito, at one time one of the fastest planes in the world. And the original models of these used to carry this, the Cookie, the 4,000-pound bomb, which would be dropped by the Lancaster as well. Then they modified the Mosquito. And a guy who knows all about the modifying, and I must apologize, is George Stewart, who flew 50 yeah. missions in 1944 in a plane just like this. I want to start out by asking you, why did they modify it to change it from a bomber? Because when they modified, yeah. they added the guns. Well, but they produced the bomber, which had a, a lot long range and carried a huge bomb eventually, uh, they thought they could do other things, photographic reconnaissance, ground support, fighters, night fighting, night intruding, which I did, and uh, it became one of the most versatile aircraft of the war. But in the process of doing all of that, because there was such urgency to produce it, little things were left out. It became like? a terror to fly. Uh, both, uh, propeller, both propellers turned the same way. It was a tail dragger with too small a rudder. You couldn't steer it till you're doing 70 miles an hour. The kind I flew weighed up to 11 tons, and it was a two-seater. 11 tons, so 22,000 pounds. Yeah. Now, the other thing, uh, George, is so this would be the, the guns, but you had to get in here. That was another change. When they took the bombs, the bomber version, and made it into a fighter, they put four 20 millimeter cannons here, which extended well into the bomb bay and the entry door. So they sealed that off and they carved another hole here just ahead of the radiator, just ahead of where the navigator sat so you could climb up a rickety little ladder and into your seat. And so you had 50 missions and basically what were you doing in those missions? Well, I was a night intruder pilot, but we were strictly bomber support. If we, uh, we went up to hover around German night fighter bases, mm -hmm. Uh, who were sending up swarms of night fighters to attack our bombers, they'd come back with no ammunition, very little fuel, and find that we were there waiting for them with four 20 millimeter cannons, four 303 machine guns, two 500 pound bombs, and about 600 gallons of gas. George Stewart, and uh, we, we have to leave it there, but fascinating story. And I just want to say again, I, it, George is 89 years old and flew in 1944, and you were 19 and 20 then, right? Yes, I Absolutely. was. Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, nice to see you, sir. Jeff, thank you.